Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, as always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go subscribe there and get our free 31-page PDF. Uh, it's of the top 200 drugs. It's a study guide. I pull out real-world clinical practice pearls as well as things that often show up on pharmacology and board exams. So I definitely don't want to go without that resource. Uh, Great uh, free opportunity there for you to have uh, something to kind of refresh yourself of some of the most important things from uh, some of the top 200 medications. All right, so let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is doxycycline. Uh, Brand name is Vibramycin. Uh, in all honesty, I, I don't hear people call it that very often. It's pretty much always doxycycline in clinical practice. Uh, it is a tetracycline derivative, and this is uh, from the class of antibiotics, the tetracyclines. And with that, um, the dosing is very uh, similar and, and, and common in many, many conditions. So uh, 100 milligrams twice a day is kind of the standard uh, treatment for any bacterial infection. There's a couple of exceptions to that, uh, but by and large, 100 milligrams twice a day is what you uh, most frequently see as far as dosing goes. Mechanistically, this drug uh, binds the uh, 30S ribosomal uh, portion of the ribosomal subunits, which ultimately impairs protein synthesis of bacteria. So as far as the replication growth process, uh, that's where bacteria are inhibited, and it ultimately stops and blunts uh, the growth of bacteria and treats the infection that we're trying to treat. Now, uses. Uh, I remember having a, a joke in pharmacy school that uh, if you were taking a, an, an exam on infectious disease and you weren't sure what the right answer was as far as treating a specific infection, doxycycline is a good guess. So doxycycline treats a bunch of kind of unique and wacky infections. Uh, So here's some examples of uh, Bartonella species. Uh, It's used in uh, bite wound prophylaxis and and treatment. So dogs, cats, things like that. It's often a a potential option there. Uh, Brucellosis infections, cholera, uh, Lyme's disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, can be used for chlamydia and STD type treatment. So again, lots of kind of unique uh, indications for doxycycline and it has activity against kind of lots of uh, different unique bacteria that you maybe don't see terribly often uh, on a routine basis in clinical practice. Uh, additionally, I do occasionally see it used uh, chronically in patients who are managing acne. Now, usually when we get to systemic antibiotic therapy, this is patients with, you know, more moderate to severe acne that, you know, other combinations of medications haven't worked or been that effective. Um, So doxycycline, uh, you may see it used occasionally uh, in the management of acne. And of course, community acquired pneumonia. So it is an alternative uh, potential option in treating uh, community-acquired pneumonia. Typically, we think of, uh, you know, beta-lactam, plus or minus uh, azithromycin, a macrolide antibiotic. But in patients maybe with a a beta-lactam allergy, for example, um, that might be a situation where we might consider uh, doxycycline as a potential option there. All right, so let's talk about adverse effects. Uh, So one of the first things that I think is a really important education point that you tell your patients about is the uh, potential issue with uh, GI problems. So uh, GI upset, and maybe more specifically like esophagitis, uh, can happen, and uh, potentially to the extreme case of esophageal ulcers. And I kind of lump doxycycline in with um, bisphosphonates, so a drug like oral alendronate in that administration process. So uh, you really probably want to tell your patients to to stay upright for a significant amount of time or at least tell them not to take it like right before bed. So 
like if they were to take it right before bed and then lay down instantly or right away after they take it, that's probably not a good thing. And we're probably going to increase that risk for that pill kind of irritating the esophagus and potentially um, causing uh, an ulcer if it gets severe enough. So um, taking with a, a good amount of fluids, a full glass of water, for example, and maybe remaining upright for a period of time, those can help alleviate uh, those potential issues a little bit as far as that esophageal ulceration risk. Uh, another adverse effect, sun sensitivity, uh, definitely one of the, the top drugs that you should know and should educate your patients about, particularly uh, if it's uh, summer or if you live in an area uh, where you, you get a lot of sun throughout the day. Um, it can really contribute to sunburn and uh, some skin issues for sure. And then we've got uh, possible bone growth suppression, and that's most likely to occur or highest risk in uh, infants, uh, pre preemies typically. Um, so that is something that we uh, is concerning, particularly in young patients, so pediatric patients. Um, most of the evidence, along with growth suppression, uh, is uh, tooth discoloration as well and skin pigment changes. And again, this is more so in pediatrics. And most of the evidence is associated with tetracycline, not specifically doxycycline. Um, but as a class, certainly this is a concerning issue in pediatrics. And so if it's ever going to be used in kids, um, you definitely have to do uh, risk-benefit type education with the patient, their parent, obviously, um, and make sure that they understand that there are potential risks like that growth suppression, tooth discoloration, pigment changes um, that come along with the potential use of doxycycline. Now, again, most of that evidence has been shown with tetracycline derivatives, and obviously the greater the exposure to the drug, so higher dosages, longer periods of use, um, those risks are going to become uh, more and more prevalent. So again, a lot of controversy kind of surrounding that and how great that risk really is with doxycycline, but it is definitely something to note um, and important to think about if you ever see a pa pediatric patient uh, taking doxycycline, um, it's definitely uh, something that that should be treated with a lot of respect and recognize uh, that there may be some potential risks. So in general, treating non-severe infections, um, we're not going to use doxycycline in pediatric patients. Uh, if there's a rare situation where doxycycline is the only effective drug, that type of thing, it's a very severe infection, uh, we're going to have that kind of risk-benefit discussion potentially uh, with patients and run through some of those risks associated with the medication. All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, medication therapy management, or if you're a pharmacy student taking the NAPLEX, go check out our list of resources at meded101.com store. Your support there at MedEd 101 directly supports this podcast. So please go support the sponsor. Uh, and in association with that sponsor, we also have some uh, highlighted books and resources for other healthcare professionals like nurses, med students, dietitians. So go check out all those resources at meded101.com slash store. Links to all those different resources can be found there. All right, so let's wrap up with drug interactions. So I think the most important thing to remember is binding interactions with doxycycline. So think of all the metal cations. So calcium supplements, iron, magnesium, uh, many antacid type products are going to have um, these metal cations within them. So that's going to essentially bind up the drug and make it less bioavailability. So essentially, it's like you're reducing the dose of the drug by giving it with some of these metal cations, okay? Now, in practice, I can tell you patients are taking supplements all the time. 
uh, calcium, magnesium, definitely. I've seen those a ton. Um, so you, you've got to ask the questions and you've got to ask them when they are going to take the doxycycline and when uh, they take other medications as well. And obviously asking specifically about uh, some of those supplements. So again, uh, the major result of this interaction is a reduced drug absorption of doxycycline, which could lead to treatment failure. Uh, we can get around it uh, by doing, you know, two hours before or uh, four hours after those supplements or those metal cations. So that is one way to do it. Um, in my opinion, uh, and in most situations, so let's say you've got a 65-year-old taking calcium for uh, supplementation for bone health. My sense is probably just to hold that calcium for a week or two while we're taking our course of doxycycline. Because again, in most situations, doxycycline is going to be used for an acute uh, short-term infection. So you can certainly do it that way as well. Now, if it's something you know, life-threatening, if somebody's got a, a substantially low magnesium and you feel that they still need to take it, well, then we can try to space it out, uh, like I mentioned, with the, the timing where you're not taking the magnesium right with the, the doxycycline. So a few different ways to kind of look at that. Um, it's easiest to, to just kind of hold the supplement if that's possible and if that's not a big deal. Um, otherwise, we can uh, really look at that timing and uh, we really don't want to run into treatment failure. So avoiding that co-administration, I think, is a, a nice thing to do. Uh, to ensure that we're getting uh, the adequate dose there. Uh, I also wanted to mention a couple of other, um, I guess, not necessarily drug-drug interactions, but more dietary interactions. So um, alcohol can reduce or impair absorption potentially. If you've got a, a heavy drinker, it uh, can decrease that absorption of doxycycline. Um, milk is going to have a substantial kind of calcium within it. So you probably want to avoid co-administration there. And really large uh, fat intakes can potentially impair absorption as well. Uh, in general, I say most, most patients are probably going to take it with some food. And that's really to avoid uh, that esophageal irritation issue. That's why we're, we're going to do that. But if you take it with potentially... Uh, the wrong foods, you could really uh, substantially impair that absorption. So uh, just kind of some, some food for thought, uh, pun intended there. Now, let's talk about more specific uh, drugs. So your enzyme inducers, carbamazepine, phenytoin, or fampin, they can have some modest effects uh, in reducing doxycycline concentration. So I think it's important to look out for those. Um doxycycline can increase warfarin concentration. So I think it's definitely important to uh, pay attention uh, to that. We're probably going to monitor INR more frequently as a patient is taking doxycycline. And then we've got some of the uh, drugs that are kind of classic binding drugs. So sucralfate, so that's a medication used for GI upset and GERD and things like that. And then bile acid uh, sequestrants, so a drug like cholestyramine, for example. These can bind up doxycycline and ultimately uh, reduce absorption if we're co-administering these medications together. All right, so I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, do us a huge favor, leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, share us with friends, colleagues, that type of thing. Go subscribe, get that free PDF at reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, and of course, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. That helps keep this podcast going, uh, helps support the podcast, obviously, and allows us to uh, reach a greater audience by using uh, some of the financial contributions that you guys have uh, so generously shared, as well as getting uh, great products that can help you uh, pass your board exam or just become a better clinician. All right. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to reach out to me, mededucation101 at gmail.com, or you can probably track me down on LinkedIn is the best way to do that. Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS. Thank you. Take care. and I hope you have a great rest of your day.